was born in Leipzig on the 22nd day of May, 1813, in a room on the second floor of the Red and White Lion, and two days later was baptized at St. Thomas Church and christened Wilhelm Richard Wagner. taken from Richard Wagner's autobiography, begins the story of a man who, although he was far from being a model of behavior, became one of the world's universal geniuses. For Richard Wagner was not only a composer, but one of the finest conductors of all time, a great poet, a marvelous architect, a philosopher, a theatrical reformer, and one of the great revolutionists of art and music. From the beginning, Wagner seemed beset by troubles. When he was born, the hordes of Napoleon held Leipzig, and a great war was raging. Little Richard was scarcely six months old when his father, who was a minor city official, died and left his mother to care for Richard, his sisters, and his brothers. It wasn't long until Wagner's mother was married again to Ludwig Geyer, an actor. Richard grew to be very fond of his stepfather, who was to give him a fine understanding of the theater. By this time, the family had moved to Dresden, one of Germany's great centers of art and theater. enough, Wagner wasn't more than casually interested in music. To be sure, he grew to know and love the then revolutionary operas of Karl Maria von Weber. In fact, he met the composer at his stepfather's home numerous times. But it was theater that Richard was interested in. None of his family was interested in music. Why should he be? He learned to play the piano, but never very well. He managed to get into a good deal of mischief. His stepfather, who called Ricard the Cossack because he was so wild, wrote, Ricard left a trouser seat per day on our hedge, but poor friendly Geyer was soon very ill and taken to bed. He lay there one night, listening to Ricard banging away at a Weber aria in the next room. Do you think it is possible that the boy has musical talent? He asked his wife. The next day, he was dead and Richard's mother needed all the help she could muster to keep the family together. The other children, all older than Richard, went into the theater. Richard went to school, and in some subjects at least, did very well. At the age of 13, he was able to translate Greek with great ease. Music? No, not yet. Of all the great composers of the world, Wagner started latest. He was still interested in the theater, and was writing a play. A melodrama, in fact, in which he confesses he killed off no less than 42 characters, but had to bring them back as ghosts or the play would have ended for lack of actors. The family, what was left of it, moved back to Leipzig, 
and it was there at one of the famed concerts of the Gewandhaus Orchestra that Wagner was to receive his most lasting impression. Beethoven had just died, and incredibly enough, Richard had never heard any of his symphonies. When the great orchestra ceased playing, Wagner knew what he must be. Here are his own words. I only remember that one evening I heard a symphony of Beethoven's for the first time, that it set me in a fever, and on my recovery, I had become a musician. Wagner had a one-track mind. Just as firmly as he was going to be a man of the theater before, now, just as firmly, he was going to be a composer. Nothing was going to stop him. No one would hinder him. He would do anything, lie, cheat, steal, to become a great musician. He was to do all of these things. He was to wound his friends, steal from them, hurt them cruelly. But there can be no question of it. He became a great composer. His first music teacher was bad, or anyhow, bad for Richard. His second, Theodore Weinlig, saw immediately that this was no ordinary pupil. To begin with, he was just starting to study music at 16. He had, even then, strangest ideas regarding a revolution of opera. Weinlig told the headstrong boy that to upset the rules, you first had to learn them. Learn to write a fugue. Maybe you'll find it helpful. Richard heeded his advice. He would copy the scores of Beethoven symphonies or write forehand piano arrangements of them, just for practice. In no time at all, even Weinlig was satisfied. Wow! Wow! He wrote a symphony and a couple of overtures, all rather poor music, I'm sorry to say. He was a political revolutionary, although his knowledge of politics was nil. He traveled to Vienna for a vacation, which one imagines his mother could ill afford. On his return, he promptly began work on his first opera, The Fairies, in frank imitation of Weber. Here is part of the overture. Although the opera was not performed, the overture was, and was a big success. Wagner was then 21 years old. There was never any question, really. Symphonies were all very well, but Beethoven had written the great symphonies. Now Wagner felt destined to write operas, operas on a scale that no one had ever before conceived. His next was to be adapted from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure and was called Love is Forbidden. It was performed, but it was not a success.
In 1834, Wagner turned to conducting and was appointed conductor in the town of Magdeburg. No sooner had he done that than the Wagner family was introduced to the young lady who was to be Wagner's wife, Minna. This lovely young woman probably never understood Wagner, if indeed anyone understood him. She was to share his humble home, for Wagner was to learn what it was to be poor and suffer much from him before she died. Wagner was rightly dissatisfied with the opera and the operatic productions he had seen. He knew that he could do better than anyone of his day. Money, though, was a pressing problem. To write opera, you needed money, peace, and quiet. He was given a chance as conductor of the Riga Opera House, and he took it. But soon, due to his extravagances, he was forced to flee just one step ahead of his creditors. He took with him the libretto for the new opera he was writing called Rienzi. This was to be his first important work. It was styled in heroic proportions. Thousands in the cast, great choruses, fine arias. Although it was not to make the composer much money, it was to gain a good reputation for him. He took a long trip to Paris by sea, and there he met Meyerbeer, a famous German composer of the day, who tried to help the impatient young man. But disaster plagued his steps. His money gave out. He did anything for a living, even arranging opera arias for trumpet. A theater which might have produced Rienzi went bankrupt. But no matter what the disaster, Wagner worked day and night. He had an idea for another opera, The Flying Dutchman. This ghostly story of the phantom ship which comes to port was merely an idea on paper, and he hastened to sell it to an opera impresario. Was the impresario interested? Yes, he was. Very interested. Well then, Wagner would start to work on the libretto and music. Oh no, that was not what the impresario had in mind. He wanted no scatterbrained German to write music for his theater. All he liked was the story. Another composer would write the music. If Wagner hadn't desperately needed the money, he probably would have struck the man. As it was, he accepted the offered money and started to work on the music himself. <laughs> Thank you. 
His luck seemed to turn somewhat. Dresden accepted Rienzi for performance. Despite delays, it was finally produced with success on October 24th, 1842. Then, in January of the next year, The Flying Dutchman was produced. It was a failure, as it was too radical a work for the public. For it was here that Wagner began his revolution. Gone were arias, choruses, duets. The work was one vast experience without separate parts. The music flowed from beginning to end. It was a great work, but no one liked it. Well, almost no one. For Franz Liszt heard it and was much impressed. Spohr, a celebrated conductor, wrote Wagner a letter of great praise and produced the opera himself. Wagner was again at work on Tannhäuser, a story based on a medieval legend. As usual, Wagner himself wrote the book. In 1845, it had its debut. It was an even more outstanding work than The Flying Dutchman, and consequently even more of a failure. Meanwhile, Wagner had been appointed conductor of the Dresden Opera, and began to train the orchestra according to his ideas, which were very strict. Despite opposition, the orchestra was soon a well-trained group. was a great believer in political revolution and unfortunately for him got involved in an uprising in Dresden. He barely escaped with his life thanks to the help of his now firm friend Liszt. living now in Zurich, Switzerland, with Minna, as poor as a church mouse, as usual. The next opera was to be Lohengrin, the story of a knight who comes to aid a beautiful maiden and who finally returns to his own land because the maiden doesn't trust him. It is from the beginning of the third act of Lohengrin that this famous bridal march is taken. Thank you. 
Liszt produced it at Weimar with success in 1850, but Wagner was not to hear it, as he had been exiled from Germany. Tristan and Isolde is a story which Wagner found in a book of Irish legend. It was to absorb him for almost four years. Wagner was asking for better and better singers, larger orchestras, often with no luck at all. In Vienna, which had planned to produce Tristan, it was cancelled after rehearsals because a tenor good enough to do it justice could not be found. It was not until 1865 that Tristan was first produced in Munich. Wagner occasionally would turn his hand to other forms of music. Matilda Wesendorf, a young, beautiful woman whom the composer had met, had written some poetry, which he set to music. One of the songs, Dreams, became a study for the music to Tristan. Nothing had kept the wolf from the door. First, Wagner just wasn't earning much money. He was extravagant to the extreme, and finally, it took a lot of money to write an opera. He traveled to England, Russia, anywhere that people would listen to his music and his talk of revolutionizing opera. He returned to Paris, and at first, things seemed better. The Paris Opera was going to stage Tannhäuser and give it a splendid production. For this performance, Wagner was asked to write a ballet, which he inserted after the overture. The trouble was that Wagner blundered because he didn't know the Paris public. The Jockey Club, which contained some of Paris's noisiest young men, wanted to see the ballet, but always arrived late. When they found that they had missed the ballet, the rest of the opera was booed off stage. This worst of all moments in Wagner's life, a miracle occurred. First, he was allowed to come back to Germany. And best of all, King Ludwig of Bavaria summoned Wagner to his court. The king told Wagner that he was to have a handsome pension and a house. His operas were to be performed with him directing in Munich. It all seemed too good to be true. The first fruit of King Ludwig's generous gift was to be what many believe to be Wagner's greatest work, the Meistersinger. For once, it was a comic opera, the story of the medieval guilds of singers who held a contest of songs. Everything about Meistersinger is perfect, beginning with a mighty prelude.
Wagner created in Hans Sachs one of the most beloved of all operatic characters. Sachs, the shoemaker, is the philosopher of the piece. The world, he sings, is mad, but all will still be right. Walter von Stolzing, the young knight who vies for the hand of the beautiful Eva, sings one of Wagner's finest melodies, the prize song. Wagner took this opportunity to attack one of his most vicious and narrow-minded critics, a man named Hanslick. In the character of Beckmesser, Wagner skillfully portrays the untalented, thieving villain who wants to win Eva for himself. The Meister Singer had its premiere in 1868 with Hans von Bülow as the conductor. As usual, it was a mixed success. The Wagnerites, as they were called, cheered it to the rafters. The anti-Wagnerites booed horribly. By this time, Wagner was no longer in bad financial difficulty and was able to devote all his time and energy to composition. He had attracted many powerful and influential friends. Among them were the greatest conductors of the age, Seidel, Mottl, Richter, and Levy. For some years, Wagner had been obsessed with the idea of adapting the old Norse legends and a German tale known as the Ring of the Nibelung to music. one opera, to be called Siegfried's Death, and for this he wrote the libretto. Later, he decided it needed a preface, to be called The Young Siegfried. And then he added two more operas, changed the name of the first two, and finally, the cycle, The Ring of the Nibelung, took shape. The operas of this gigantic work are Rheingold, The Valkyrie, Siegfried, and finally, the Twilight of the Gods. It is from this final work that we are now hearing the episode known as Siegfried's Rhine Journey.
This gigantic group of operas occupied Wagner off and on for over 26 years. The book alone took four years to write. In The Twilight of the Gods, Wagner called for stage effects the like of which had never been seen. Siegfried's body is placed on a burning funeral pyre in a great hall. Brunhilde mounts her horse and rides into the flame. The hall collapses. The Rhine River overflows its banks and rushes into the remains of the hall. The Rhine maidens swim into it, and in the background, the home of the gods is seen also devoured by the flames of the pyre. All this has to happen on an opera stage. It was here that Wagner's early theatrical experience helped him, for he even invented the machinery to make all of these effects possible. But mere machinery wasn't enough for Wagner. He wanted an opera house designed to house his operas, and only his operas. The architect was, you've guessed it, Richard Wagner. It took years, a tremendous amount of money that even King Ludwig could not give in full. But finally, it was built in the little German town of Bayreuth and called the Festival House. And what a magnificent house it was. There were no pillars and no boxes or posts, so that everyone had an equally good view of the stage, no matter where he sat. Wagner had long since parted from poor Minna, and in 1868 she died. Soon after, Wagner married Cosima, who was the daughter of Franz Liszt, and formerly the wife of Hans von Bülow, the great conductor. Cosima presented Wagner with a son, Siegfried, and Wagner prepared a charming surprise for his beloved wife. Christmas Day, Cosima awoke to hear the most wonderful music coming from just outside her room. What Wagner had done was compose a piece of music just for Cosima. Quietly, in the morning, the musicians had assembled on the stairs outside of Cosima's rooms, and the music was the Siegfried Idol. He was soon composing again. This time it was to be a consecrational play of sacred nature called Parsifal, the story of the knights who guarded the Holy Grail. The Good Friday music, which we are now hearing, is one of the most beautiful pieces Wagner ever wrote. Parsifal was to be his final work, for Richard Wagner died 
on February 13th, 1883, in Venice. As usual, his mind was full of ideas for an opera. This one was to have been Jesus of Nazareth. It is often hard to understand, let alone to like Wagner, but it is not at all difficult to love his music, which has for so long enriched the arts. <laughs> 